One thing that seems pretty critical to the moral code of the military is leave no man behind. Uh, what did it do to the morale of the American men and women mm -hmm. that were serving in Afghanistan, that we ended the war the way we did? I think you know, this idea of you know, leave no man behind, I mean, this is not an idea that is only unique to the United States military, although it is foundational to the code of honor that exists in the U.S. military. I mean, this is an idea that is as old as warfare. It's an idea that goes back you know, to the Iliad when Achilles kills Hector. You know, Achilles, or Hector's father shows up in Achilles' camp begging for the body of his son. So when we left Afghanistan, effectively what the U.S. government was doing, because there was no visa system in place, there was no process to get our allies out, we were basically saying as a country that we're going to leave all these Afghans behind and asking the people who had personal relationships with the Afghans, who we had cultivated over 20 years, in many respects at the behest of our government, to just turn our backs on these people who are asking for help. And it shouldn't come as a surprise that many people, veterans, journalists, activists who've been involved in over 20 years, you know, weren't willing to do that. You yourself have served on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan. You're highly decorated, Silver Star, Bronze Star for Valor, Purple Heart. Um, not every day we have people like that on the show. Uh, could you just walk me through what happened, uh, the experience you had that led to one of those decorations? Oh, sure. I mean, the, um, you know, I think something people don't always talk about or realize about those decorations is there's sort of a double-edged sword. I mean, it's obviously a great honor to receive any type of award like that, but you're often being recognized for, you know, one of the worst days of your life mm -hmm. um, because they, when everything on the mission goes perfectly according to plan, they usually don't hand out those awards. Um, you know, I, I received the Silver Star for uh, actions in, in Fallujah for basically man, probably manning a machine gun uh, on our rooftop during a very tough day during that battle. So that's... That's one instance of it. Do you feel that the military is adequately understood slash appreciated for everything that you have done, do in the United States? Well, I think a concerning trend that we've seen in American life, if you look back at the history of our country almost since its inception, we've had a very long tradition of a military that was comprised of citizen soldiers. And in recent years, we've seen the all-volunteer military really become the norm. I served in the all-volunteer military. There are certain benefits of having an all-volunteer military, namely the, you know, the professionalism. You don't have anyone there who doesn't want to be there. Mm -hmm. um, but it does come with a cost, and one of those costs is, is an ever-widening civil-military divide where fewer and fewer people know anyone who has served in the military, and the military really becomes uh, a caste of its own in the United States, sort of this hived off 1% of America. And that is particularly dangerous in a society that has very dysfunctional domestic politics. You know, if you look back in history from Caesar's Rome to Napoleon's France, when you couple a large standing military with dysfunctional domestic politics, democracy doesn't last long. And that's something I think about um, and that certainly concerns me. You know, that's not the American people not you know, paying enough deference to the military. In many respects, my concern is that they, there's too much deference that pay, is paid, and that deference is paid uh, in lieu of understanding, in lieu of experience with the military, and that's something I, I think about and concerns me.